and other collaborators of mine who aren't here, since we've had several people here, obviously, uh, that, that I have the good fortune to be collaborating with. But the, the spirit of all this is, of course, uh, we all know that galaxy and star formation is a fundamentally incredibly multi-scale process. And, you know, uh, what we're trying to do is, you know, build up our knowledge and understanding of these microphysics to sort of link them back up uh, to the largest scales as uh, illustrated here. So I'll start really micro and build up. So I just want to mention very briefly some interesting work I've been doing uh, with a postdoc, John O'Squire, about dust. And, you know, love it or hate it, we all care about dust, even if it's just as the thing that gets in the way of our observations. And uh, John O has this uh, lovely uh, uh, paper uh, where he's basically discovered this incredibly broad class of instabilities, of dust gas mixtures, which are basically all of astrophysics. Um, so what he shows in this paper, and this is absurd, I uh, had worked with him at the beginning and we've realized there's this class of instabilities and I just did it, you know, old fashioned dispersion relation way and Jono wasn't satisfied enough because his intuition was this should be much more general. And he shows mathematically in this paper that allow the hydrodynamic equations for the gas to be anything, anything that supports some linear mode of response to perturbations. That's the constraint. Couple to that a set of dust equations, which is continuity, momentum, plus anything. The, con the momentum equation has a form that looks like this, some coupling operator times the relative velocity of the dust and gas. So for example, uh, the simplest one is if you've got dust moving through neutral uh, gas, you just have a friction uh, drag force, just aerodynamic drag. Uh, what you can show is this system of equations is generically unstable and produces exponentially growing dust to gas ratio fluctuations. And if you have resonances between the speed at which the dust is moving and the natural waves of the system, the resonances grow uh, with growth rates, linear growth rates that formally are infinite. They, they have uh, uh, no uh, upper limit. So here's some simulations we've been doing of this. This is a box, just a periodic box of gas where all we're doing is accelerating dust grains, which are the black points. Uh, this is edge on and face on. Uh, so the dust is getting accelerated this way. And these are order of magnitude fluctuations in the gas density. And just by eye, you can see orders of magnitude fluctuations in the dust density being generated by this instability uh, because dust and gas are not uh, perfectly coupled. And if you try to push dust through gas or push gas through dust, it is unstable, always basically. Uh, there's no way to escape these. There might be astrophysical situations where the growth rates of this instability are slow enough that we might not care about them, or uh, more likely, we've done some back-of-the-envelope calculations for star-forming regions and galaxies and regions around AGN. This should be happening. It's happening on very small scales, which is why we don't obviously see these, but if you care about dust physics for obscuration or grain growth or chemistry, you care that on micro scales, the clumping factor is a million, not one. Uh, so. That's all I can say about it, because I'm trying to hit a bunch of different things. So moving up in scale, uh, uh, we've also been thinking about the IMF, and this is work led by David Gusenyov, who's been working with uh, myself and Mark Krumholtz primarily, uh, studying the IMF and the role of feedback, by which I mean here, since we're talking about do you form too many brown dwarfs, feedback is infrared heating of dust around accreting protostars. And he and many others have argued that uh, the only way to reproduce the turnover mass in the IMF is to account for feedback from protostars, uh, specifically the sort of thermal uh, feedback. The interesting point for people in this room is that uh, David nicely showed in a recent paper that uh, to the best of our knowledge, every model that we could find that has ever been used in an extragalactic paper, including three papers I'm on, um, uh, to model how the IMF might vary in other galaxies is wrong. And how do we know that? Well, you can apply that model in a high resolution simulation of a Milky Way-like galaxy, or just taking the scaling laws of Milky Way-like galaxies and apply those IMF models cloud to cloud across the Milky Way and show that you predict far more variance in the Milky Way's IMF than we observe. We actually know the IMF in the Milky Way is close to universal. And so if you take a naive model, like let me assume in my simulations that the IMF turnover mass scales with the genes mass or the velocity dispersion of the galaxy or the cloud or the uh, temperature of the gas, uh, you can rule them all right out. They would all predict far more variation than we see in the Milky Way. There's a very narrow subclass of models that have been discussed in the literature, in the star formation literature, that are these feedback regulated models that survive that test. So it's really worth thinking about, because there's been a lot of excitement about potential IMF variation in nearby centers of massive ellipticals, and we need to think 
you know, before we run around like I did a couple of years ago and write papers about how we could explain that, you know, can our model even survive the local tests of nearby IMF uh, variation? He's also done a lot of work on why star formation is clustered at a very fundamental level. Star formation is clustered for the same reason that galaxies are clustered. Basically, gravitational collapse is an inherently hierarchical process. And you can show that actually there's a ludicrously universal correlation function uh, for basically all self-gravitating hierarchical structures um, that extends from, you know, a hundredth of a parsec to uh, KPC scales. Moving up, uh, another student, Mike Grudick, has been thinking about uh, star clusters and star cluster formation in simulations of sort of single massive GMC complexes collapsing. This is from, uh, this is sort of the punchline of his paper, the fraction of a cloud that gets turned into stars as a function of the surface density uh, of that cloud, where you see here an example where a cloud starts collapsing, forming stars, and then is destroyed by some combination of warm gas uh, pressure from H2 regions uh, uh, and eventually supernovae at the end. And you know, these are sort of Milky Way-like clouds down here at the very low density end, but we're interested in sort of how this extrapolates. And it's very hard to avoid at very high de surface densities, basically turning these things entirely into uh, stars. And this gives you a very natural uh, uh, understanding of why certain things will form protoglobular clusters. And very similar results, I should say, have been obtained uh, recently by, for example, uh, uh, Eva Stryker, uh, uh, and a couple other groups. Uh, and the basic argument is just uh, gravity versus feedback. Like we've talked about on large scales, you just do it for a single cloud. Gravity scales like GMM over R squared, feedback scales like the mass of massive stars. You set these two equal and you have a term that looks like a surface density uh, that tells you that gravity wins at higher surface densities because it gets that extra factor of, of surface density. It's just that M over R squared from GMM over R squared is all that is. We're working on a follow-up that's comparing all sorts of environmental properties of star clusters, and the hope is to, again, extend these to apply them to cosmological simulations to get a better insight into models for star cluster formation and what they tell us about where and when star clusters form. And the reason is because we're starting to push, uh, uh, here I'm advertising work by Andrew Wetzel, this triple latte simulation that Cameron Hummels mentioned, but other groups as well are starting to push on resolution where we can start to resolve the, the top end of the uh, globular cluster, or cluster, massive cluster, young massive cluster mass function in cosmological runs. So this is a movie of the last billion years of evolution of the regular latte simulation, so resolution of only 7,000 solar masses in a Milky Way run to Z of zero. Uh, and this is the, as I said, the last billion years flying around the galaxy. Uh, but we've now got at Z of, uh, I think it's at 0.3 or so, the triple latte run with 850 or 880 solar mass uh, resolution. Uh, so we're really going to be able to, to ask some exciting questions. Now, uh, 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 rather than wait for that, uh, we've uh, pushed a little bit on what we can do with uh, existing runs. Uh, uh, and I'll come back to the star cluster point in just a second. You can also look at things like, uh, since you're resolving these large scales, the mass functions and internal properties of GMCs. This is the GMC mass function and line width size relation, so internal properties of molecular clouds compared to actual Milky Way and nearby galaxy observations. So this is also important as the simulations start pushing on these kinds of resolutions. You know, we've had debate, and I'll say some probably controversial things in a couple minutes in this talk about the massive clumps at high redshift, but it's really important that we vet these models also against the Milky Way itself, and if, uh, you know, see if we start reproducing the properties of real clouds in our nearby galaxy. And again, that's David Gusenyov, who's thinking about this, sorry, so then uh, coming back to the star cluster point, rather than wait for this very expensive simulation with 800 solar mass resolution to get to Z of zero, uh, Sheng Cheng Ma had run some of these uh, simulations already to Redshift 5, uh, where it's much cheaper, of course, to run with that kind of resolution. And Ji Hoon, uh, who many of us here know very well, uh, uh, jumped on the opportunity to look at, uh, you know, star cluster formation in this high redshift environment with that kind of resolution. And this is a example from his paper showing that the, this is the mass, half mass radius versus mass of star clusters identified in the simulation. The vast majority are up here at high radius. This is just basically open clusters and associations. They're not remotely bound uh, objects and they aren't uh, coherent uh, over large periods of time. You don't identify the same object uh, if they're up here. But then you've got a subset of clusters that are down here that are very dense, uh, self-gravitating, and they live uh, persistently for a large fraction of the life of the simulation. So, uh, and those, this on the bottom right is a histogram of surface density 
of uh, star clusters formed in some simulations of galaxy mergers with comparable resolution. So each of the histograms is a different galaxy merger. And you get this very strongly bimodal structure where the sort of second mode is these uh, uh, bound clusters. The first mode, uh, this orange histogram at low densities, the dashed histogram here is the surface density distribution of GMCs that we identified in the same simulation shifted by 5%. So it's basically saying GMC turns a few percent of its mass into stars, blows up. That works very nicely to explain most associations. But then you've got the second population at high densities. And what gave us some faith, even though the resolution here isn't ideal for cluster simulations, is that the transition between these two populations is exactly where you would have predicted it from that plot I showed a couple of slides ago from Mike Grudick's work of single cluster formation simulations, showing basically where does a cluster turn most of its mass into stars or a proto-cluster cloud versus where does it mostly unbind the mass, which is naively what you think you need. So let's keep going up in scales. We'll keep racing upwards. Uh, so on KPC scales, we've got the schmidt kennicott relation and all of its cousins, which uh, my student Matt Orr has been looking at. Uh, and we heard uh, uh, some very nice discussion uh, earlier about uh, star formation efficiencies on these intermediate scales. So I'm not going to repeat some of the very nice arguments that have been made. Matt's actually building uh, uh, some similar kinds of uh, simplistic semi-analytic models to try and interpret uh, you know, things like the scatter and the KS law, et cetera. But again, on large scales, it's really just a competition uh, between feedback and gravity uh, setting the star formation efficiency. And again, uh, many people have made this point. Once again, uh, uh, Eve Ostraker has beaten me to the punch this time by a decade. But, um, uh, but uh, uh, and Matt's also been looking at some of the, the denser gas tracers and the resolved star formation tracers and how they vary. You know, if you measure the KS law on 100 parsec scales versus 5 kiloparsec scales, is it telling you physically different information? Is it just noisier by random chance or is there actually different physics that determines the normalization or the efficiencies on different scales? And what can we pull out about that? So he's working on uh, exploring that. Uh, Kung Yi Su uh, uh, has been also uh, asking whether or not uh, other physics could influence this. Uh, magnetic fields, uh, conduction, viscosity. Uh, he's also been working recently on cosmic rays, uh, although the, the conclusions there we don't have yet. Uh, but for at least all the MHG stuff, he's got uh, a, a couple papers out that uh, I feel a little bad for him. Uh, they're very interesting results uh, and very important results, but they keep being the null result that basically, yeah, magnetic fields don't really make that much difference on these large scales. And, and you know, there are probably regimes like the CGM where they can be very important, as we heard uh, very elegantly uh, described earlier. But in terms of sort of star formation self-regulation on galactic scales, uh, they're very second order. Um, so here's where I said I'd say some potentially controversial things. Antonio Klopchik, uh, who's now at CFA, uh, has been looking at, uh, speaking of KPC scale structures, the giant clumps in high redshift galaxies. And uh, the, these are some uh, examples of a case study of a galaxy you see the gas fraction decline with time, the star formation rate decline, and the clump mass decline. And it's very consistent with this simple picture where the clumps are sort of what you'd expect in a Q of order one self-regulating uh, uh, gas-rich disk. Uh, now, her conclusion was that the clumps on average are not very long-lived, and I know that's still controversial, but the striking thing uh, is that uh, you know, a lot of the observable properties are still reproduced. And in particular, I'll point out that this is her prediction from her paper, she still predicts, even though the clumps tend to be short-lived, very strong age gradients in the clumps, where the central clumps can be two, uh, a giga year old, basically, uh, inferred stellar ages, and the outer clumps are 100 million years old. And this is a stronger gradient than the background gradient, which I was just talking with uh, Joel about. Uh, uh, and this is basically happening because of differential contamination in different positions in the disk by background stars. Uh, OK, OK. Um, uh, now, you know, whether this really agrees with the observations, uh, you know, we need to do a more rigorous comparison. In particular, all of these conclusions are sensitive to how you define clumps. And so uh, the, what we really need to do is, of course, do a proper comparison where we model what's observed and how this is measured before I think we can say uh, something rigorous here. But clearly there's, you know, more work to be done. So in the last few minutes, uh, we'll go up in scale again. How does this relate to driving winds from galaxies? Well, Davide Martizzi, uh, will tell us about some of his work understanding from these kinds of simulations. These are from Steffi Walsh, but he's done similar work. Box with a patch of the ISM, how to uh, uh, understand how winds are launched. And one thing that's very clearly come across from all of this is that 
Clustered star formation matters tremendously. The fact that stars are not uniformly distributed in a disk qualitatively changes how galactic winds are generated and emerge. And you see that visually uh, here in these simulations. And that's why I brought up stellar clustering earlier, because there are you know, theoretical predictions from small scales and observational data that we can link to these kinds of models that tell us how star formation should be statistically clustered. And that makes a big difference because overlapping supernovae are key to generating chimneys, et cetera. And this is a galaxy simulation on very large scales showing the IGM temperature, and you saw it was quite bursty, and that's a related type of clustering. Clustering in space within the disk, but also clustering in time matters. And in the most dramatic sense for dwarf galaxies, star formation can be very bursty, which is really just very strong temporal clustering of star formation. And that makes much more violent outflows during the, the bursts that can be important. And Martin Spar has looked at how this compares to, say, the star formation rate, stellar mass relation, the main sequence, if you must, and the Kennecott schmidt relation. Uh, Alex Fitz has looked at how this compares to Dan Weiss's observations. These are star formation histories of dwarfs. We saw a little of this in my Cooper's talk. And then here's the sort of uh, main sequence correlations. And here's the difference between the main sequence you'd measure in H alpha and UV and showing the scatter between them that's related to the the burstiness of star formation when you have star formation indicators from different scales. And, you know, this is interesting both from just understanding uh, uh, what these relations, from the perspective of understanding what these relations mean, there's actually many important conclusions. The one I'll mention here is that a lot of the scatter at low masses and high redshifts, at least in these models, in the main sequence and in the KS law, is not a hidden systematic variable. It's not that some galaxies are systematically high and some are systematically low. It's just that you're catching it you know, up or down in effect effectively a stochastic point in time in its swing. And there doesn't have to be a sort of fundamental structural reason uh, why a galaxy is high or low on those relations. So uh, last I'll mention, this has other consequences for galactic structure. Karim al Badri very nicely showed if you have these violent bursty star formation episodes, blowing the baryons out perturbs the orbits of the dark matter, which many people uh, uh, have shown is important for creation of cores in galaxies, but it also perturbs the stellar orbits. So you puff up the stars, you get, uh, this is a, a profile stellar mass versus radius, where the blue line is if I put all the stars at the position they formed, and the white line is where they actually live at z of zero. So because of all this violent perturbation, things are puffed up. It's basically violent relaxation, just not with a merger. Uh, but it also can do weird things like invert the age and metallicity gradients by rearranging the stars. So we have to be very careful about how we interpret gradients in dwarf galaxies because you can really uh, literally reverse the sign of the gradients by this sort of mixing process. And TK Chan will show some very uh, interesting uh, models compared to observations. Uh, of how this might be important for the formation of ultra-diffuse galaxies. Uh, Sheng Cheng Ma has also worked, in addition to what he talked about here, on how you eventually transition out of this phase and calm down as gas fractions deplete, merger rates drop, et cetera, and that allows you to build up nice pretty disks, coherent metallicity gradients, et cetera, and I'm just showing this picture to, to nod to Susan. We also see disk settling uh, very similar, uh, I think, qualitatively to what other groups are seeing. Um, and Sheng, uh, Shea, Garris, and Kimmel will talk about how this relates to, to thin disks uh, uh, in the simulations. Uh, last thing on uh, galaxies, uh, Robin Sanderson has also been working on how to take these high resolution simulations and build a sort of new generation of models for the galactic halo, uh, in particular halo structure. Thinking about Gaia, we have simulations run to Z of zero with 100 million stars. It's not quite the Milky Way, but you know, we're getting close to sort of one star particle for every giant star uh, that some of these surveys are actually going to find in the halo. And so making predictions, even if, you know, even if the models are wrong, being able to explore on that kind of a model how things like chemical tagging could or couldn't work and how they relate to the underpinning physical structures is going to be really exciting. Uh, so she's basically creating uh, an entire mock Gaia data pipeline uh, for these simulations that should be uh, released in a couple months. So the very last minute, uh, Daniel Angles Alcazar uh, uh, and Paul Torrey have been working on the AGN part of FIRE, which of course, uh, uh, we've worked a lot on the stellar feedback physics, but, but we haven't thus far uh, uh, had much uh, about the AGN because as we all know, it's vastly less constrained and trickier to do. Daniel uh, started with grand ambitions of putting all the AGN physics into FIRE and realized immediately uh, there was one problem, which was you start resolving these clumpy, bursty, high-Z galaxies, 
you put a small seed black hole uh, in, it just goes flinging all over the darn place. Uh, uh, and most of them don't even stay in the galaxy. And you can cheat by pegging it to the potential center of the galaxy, but you should be able to actually resolve the, the dynamics of these things. And what you have to do is, you know, get the black holes bigger than the mass scale of ISM structure to keep them from getting flung all over the place and allow them to grow efficiently. Which means, you know, forget quasi stars, you need like 10 to the seven solar mass seeds, which are already supermassive black holes. So the best idea I've heard to explain how this might work is that, you know, preferentially the black holes that are either born in or trapped in star clusters and are thus anchored into the galaxy by a massive star cluster that they live in are the ones that, you know, will preferentially have a chance to make it supermassive. So very last slide, uh, Paul Torrey uh, has been exploring the role of uh, AGN feedback, uh, putting in uh, models of uh, broad absorption line quasar winds uh, from a central AGN. This is some very preliminary results of two merging galaxies uh, showing the gas. Uh, the red is million Kelvin gas. And this is a phase diagram, temperature density of gas that's outflowing at more than 1,000 kilometers a second. What you can see is right during the, the peak of the merger, there's a moment where the black hole activity flared up and you actually got sort of molecular outflows at 1,000 kilometers a second. This is super preliminary, but super exciting to understand objects like Markarian 231. Now you see it sort of ripping out in hot gas. So uh, uh, I'll end there. Uh, and again, it was an advertisement, so I just want you to know about these results. If they're interesting to you, look them up. Uh, thanks. So there are a few simulations in Antonia's paper. The append there's sort of a case study, and then there's an appendix with a few others. But it's still a very limited sample, certainly. Yeah. That's exactly the experiment we need to do. I, I don't know the answer. Yeah. Other questions? Um, so in our simulations, it's that sort of LMC mass. This is something where different groups get different answers. So qualitatively, everybody gets that it becomes bursty as you go to dwarf masses, or almost everybody gets that. But, but you know, there are differences in where that becomes important. And, you know, we're both trying to physically understand in the models where that comes from and, uh, you know, what physics is exactly governing that. And I, I don't have a great answer yet. But there's sort of an order of magnitude spread. I'd say we're on the higher end of where burstiness comes in, and, and other people are more SMC mass. So. Um, so the closest we looked at, Sasha Muratov has looked at how the burstiness relates to metal outflows. And a lot of the metals that get into the CGM are driven out by these bursts, and they're much more efficient at getting the metals out. But um, in terms of in sort of instantaneous, if you're thinking about something like the, the, you know, the FMR, the fundamental metallicity relation, we've looked a little bit at that. Um, uh, and you know what we see is sort of consistent with the observations, but I don't. It's not very strong as a residual uh, effect. So, yeah. Uh, Doug, did you want to? Since we're still having some technical trouble. <laughs> 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 I mean, uh, uh, you know, they're certainly bursty in the sense that, you know, their contribution to the star formation rate can rise and fall on very short time scales uh, compared to sort of the galactic uh, evolution time. Um, you know, they aren't, uh, they're often, like other groups have found, complexes, so it's not as simple as a sort of single low mass GMC where the whole cloud is either 
sort of on its way to forming stars or blowing up, uh, uh, it can be a little messier where parts of it are blowing an outflow while other parts of the complex are accreting and, and other people have certainly found that. But I don't, at least in our simulations, they're not very steady state objects. I mean, I, I would lump that in with what I was very loosely calling the sort of bursty phase of galaxy evolution, but that was just using the term loosely. Why don't we get going then? Yeah. Okay. All right, let's thank Phil again.